Hi everyone, good morning and welcome to today's Meeting of the Minds webinar on driverless urban mobility, a path towards an autonomous future. My name is Jesse feller Hahn. I'm the Executive Director of Meeting of the Minds. We're based in the San Francisco Bay Area and um, a nonprofit bringing together thought leaders across sectors to share best practices, tools, and solutions for more sustainable and smarter cities. We do that through our digital platform, which is our blog, our monthly webinar series, our online courses and our downloadable magazine. We also have an event, in-person event series throughout the year with workshops, meetups, and of course our fall annual conference, which this year convenes October 23rd to 25 in Cleveland, Ohio, where we will be continuing the conversation from today's webinar. I'm pleased to introduce James Kuffner from Toyota Research Institute, who's our presenter today. James is the Chief Technology Officer and Area Lead for Cloud Intelligence at the Toyota Research Institute, also known as TRI. He's also an Adjunct Professor, Associate Professor at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Kuffner is responsible for helping define TRI's technology and engineering strategy and manages key research and engineering teams. In 2009, he joined Google as part of the initial engineering team building Google's self-driving car. He's known for introducing the term cloud robotics in 2010 described how network connected robots could take advantage of distributed computation and data stored in the cloud. So with that, James, we're excited to have you here and take it away. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to be speaking to everybody today. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we're working on here at TRI, but also that the industry is moving towards uh, with this technology uh, and, and reflect a bit on how it could uh, potentially transform our cities in, uh, in profound ways. Um, as uh, Jesse mentioned, I got my start working in robotics and worked on a lot of different uh, humanoid robot platforms, both in Japan and the U.S., um, uh, at the University of Tokyo and, and, and CMU. Um, and then uh, in 2009, I went to Google and started working on their self-driving car team and worked on a lot of uh, AI and robotics uh, related projects there. Um, and then early in January 2016, um, uh, I joined the Toyota Research Institute uh, under our CEO, Dr. Gil Pratt, who many of you may know from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, and it was established to partner not only with uh, leading research universities, um, including uh, MIT and Cambridge, Stanford right here in Silicon Valley, and University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, but also to be a place that partners with uh, small companies and other uh, companies that are thinking about the future of uh, this new technology as it transforms both vehicles and robotics. Um, our key focus areas are in automotive safety and um, uh, autonomy, we're also looking at mobility, especially where it relates to um, aging society. And we're also looking at how cloud computing, machine learning uh, could accelerate scientific discovery. So for example, uh, could you um, uh, explore new catalysts for batteries that would lead to a much higher energy density or find a, a new material that is uh, twice the strength of high tension steel but as light as carbon fiber? So we're looking at all of those uh, technologies. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, innovation um, as represented in, in history and, and how it uh, can be used as a model for how we can expect the, uh, the maturing of this autonomous vehicle technology and how it could impact future cities and reflect a bit on how that relates to my favorite topic, which is cloud robotics. And, uh, and how it all ties together. And then um, we'll take some Q&A. Um, so first, I'd like to sort of reflect upon the computer. Um, I, many of us consider the computer as the most complex machine that humans have invented. Um, and in fact, today's computers cannot be designed without a computer. And if you uh, assemble many of them together, of course, you get the modern data center which has truly transformed uh, the way that we do business and the way that we store and manage data, especially now with all of our connected devices. And I would argue that actually the robot is really 
uh, the most complex machine that we've invented because you not only have a computer, but now you've got um, actuation and motors and you have to um, obey the laws of physics and real-time constraints uh, in all of the computation that you're doing. Um, if computers manage bits of information, uh, robots are managing and organizing atoms and applying the uh, organization of information to the physical world. And, um, and so it, what happens if you have the most powerful computing resource, which is the modern data center, connected to a robot? And uh, that's happening, and it's very exciting, both in the area of cars as well as uh, robot machines. So if we think about the evolution of the automobile, uh, there were gas-powered engines back in 1885, uh, and over the next 30 years, there was uh, incredible advances in the transmission and engine design, and of course, uh, manufacturing at scale led to the first widely affordable automobile, which completely transformed the society. The same thing uh, happened with the computer. There were early vacuum tube-based prototypes uh, in the 40s and 50s, very expensive, only a few research institutes and government labs around the world had them, but there was incredible advancement in the hardware, the storage displays, and of course the development of transistors and integrated circuits that led to a widely affordable personal computer that also completely transformed our society. And then the shift that all of us have lived through is of course the smartphone, um, back in eight, uh, 1983, you could buy a Motorola DynaTAC for about $4,000. Uh, it sometimes completed a call. Uh, but over the next 30 years, incredible advances in the network and transmission speed, um, the cost and size and weight and power led to the smartphone, which uh, now, of course, has overtaken desktops worldwide as the main computing platform for people. And what's truly remarkable is that we all take for granted that we're carrying around in our pocket uh, a supercomputer that's more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer of 20 years ago. So when we think about intelligent robots and cars, I always like to think uh, and count the clock from you know when Honda had released their first fully self-contained walking humanoid. That means it had onboard power and onboard computation. And over the last 20 years, we've had incredible advancements, not only in the sensors with uh, depth cameras and LIDARs, uh, but um, harmonic drive gears and better actuation, and of course, control planning and machine learning that are really starting to make robots incredibly capable. And um, it's always dangerous to speculate on when they'll become ubiquitous and affordable, but I certainly hope, based on the historical precedent, that it will happen uh, in our lifetime. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about autonomous cars because uh, there's been an incredible uh, advancement and, and excitement about this technology starting to mature and really and really starting to hit the industry um, in a big way. Um, there were uh, advancements in autonomous driving that were primarily led by military investments um, and DARPA had been giving away uh, and funding research at universities uh, for decades before the DARPA Grand Challenge, but they flipped the problem around in 2004 by saying, well, instead of just funding individual projects, let's just make a prize bounty and let people, uh, let's try and crowdsource all the ideas and let teams uh, kind of assemble and, and try to win a challenge. And the first challenge in 2004 was essentially GPS waypoint following um, there was no winner, uh, but the Carnegie Mellon Sandstorm had traveled the furthest. Uh, the next year they held it, there were actually a couple of uh, teams that finished. Uh, the top prize went to Stanford Racing. Um, and then two years later, they did the Urban Challenge. They upped the ante with a $2 million prize, and there were uh, uh, several teams that finished the complete route, and the top prize went to Carnegie Mellon that year. Uh, and uh, that um, led to a... Uh, a project being formed at Google um, made up of a lot of people who had been involved in the DARPA Grand Challenges. Um, and I joined that team in 2009 um, when it started, and the goal was to try and explore whether or not uh, we could make 
um, with production quality code and cloud computing uh, uh, infrastructure as part of the development, uh, something that uh, would be uh, reliable and, and work well. And um, today, of course, there's an explosion of R&D activity. Uh, there's, this is actually an old uh, headline from, from last summer. There's many, many more startups and companies looking at this technology. And uh, there's lots of reasons, and we can get into sort of the, the reasons why people are excited about this. Uh, but it, um, I think it actually comes down to um, how this technology can uh, transform our society. And I, if I look at the ingredients for disruption, um, I think there's a confluence of strong partnerships that are necessary, uh, partnerships between the universities, um, academia, industry, and government, and then, of course, a critical mass of talent and investment capital to try and bring an idea into the mainstream and uh, bring products to market. And so let's reflect for a bit about uh, this intelligent vehicle technology and, and uh, think about how it may disrupt the design of cities. Um, we take for granted that our cities fundamentally have been designed around cars and they've grown up around cars. Um, the existence of uh, freeways and traffic light systems and pedestrian overpasses and all of those things uh, evolved because of the automobile as a, as a way of, of people to get around our urban centers. What happens if you have autonomous cars and mobility as a service as your main means of transportation? So if we think about what would it take to enable a true driverless city, um, we think a lot about transportation on demand, uh, mobility as a service. Uh, that means that uh, you may not have to worry about taking your personally owned vehicle, driving to where you work in a downtown urban center, looking for a parking space, uh, and then having your, your vehicle sit idle while you're in the office um, and not be utilized. Instead, the sharing economy uh, will enable a much better utilization of that vehicle resource and you can get where you need to go on demand. Uh, potentially, that could lead to a dramatic reduction in traffic, noise, and pollution in our urban centers. If you just think about the capacity of lanes, um, there's a lot of urban centers that have curbside parking. If every car could essentially drop you off where you needed to go and then go park somewhere else, um, you would uh, immediately double, in some cases, the uh, lane capacity and flow of a lot of the streets in an urban center. That also means that land dedicated to parking lots, especially in urban centers, could then be converted to other uses, whether it's residential or commercial uses. When we think about parking, um, it's, it's useful to look at the current state of where things are at. Um, it turns out that the average car is parked approximately 95% of the time in the U.S. Uh, with about 5% on the road time. Um, worldwide, uh, people that live in urban centers spend an average of 20 minutes per trip just looking for parking. Um, and the United States has about a billion parking spots, but there's only about a quarter million, uh, quarter billion cars and trucks. So that means there's about four times more parking spaces than vehicles. If you also look at a, a, a study that was done for Los Angeles um, in 2015, they found that there were about 200 square miles of land that is currently dedicated to parking in the county. Uh, that is about 18.6 million spaces and from the data that um, is available, it seems that that's approximately 14% of all the land area in Los Angeles County. What would it mean if uh, suddenly you could be a lot smarter, not only about the utilization of the seats in your car, but also about the utilization of the parking spaces? So when we think about parking garages, um, what would driverless cars enable in terms of uh, the space utilization of a parking garage. Well, first, it, it doesn't need to be in the urban center. It means that a lot of uh, cars could essentially be like a valet. Uh, they could drop uh, passengers off 
uh, where they needed to be in a downtown center, but then park uh, outside of the center. That means that you essentially could have uh, valuable land that's currently dedicated to parking structures in the urban centers uh, rededicated to other uses, whether it's commercial or residential. It also means that the parking structures can be designed to be more efficient and densely packed. It means that if you had a robotically managed parking garage, it means that uh, you may not have requirements for uh, parking structures that contain stairs or elevators or wide alleyways um, for pedestrian access. The data-driven dispatch of on-demand transportation could also enable the system to do dynamic load balancing, uh, matching the vehicle supply in the areas where the vehicles are needed according to demand patterns. And this is, of course, a great opportunity to do data mining and machine learning uh, looking at the um, the transportation demand curves for all of the people uh, and then essentially running a giant optimization problem that will uh, match the uh, location and utilization of the fleet with the transportation demands of the city. It also means that parking lots can do a lot more than just be a place to store the car. That means that you could centralize charging stations and replace traditional gas stations. So not only would, would you be able to centralize uh, refueling and recharging from the currently very widely distributed uh, land that we have also in urban centers, and then you can reclaim and recover the land that's currently dedicated to uh, gas stations and centralize them into um, a location that could be, of course, also environmentally clean, where you had maybe solar power uh, on the on the roof and um, and using that to charge a lot of uh, clean energy vehicles. Or in the case of uh, fuel cells, you could have uh, fuel cell charging stations as well located in these structures. That also means that potentially, while uh, a vehicle is being uh, stored, it can um, uh, be maintained and. Uh, in the case of self-driving cars, uh, there's a lot of sensing equipment um, that needs to maintain calibration. You could imagine that um, uh, calibration and, and health checks and routine maintenance for the fleets of vehicles could be done in one location and make that much more efficient. Um, it also means that um, you know people have talked a lot about uh, the uh, the number of vehicles out on the road and and uh, how um, mobility as a service could uh, affect traffic patterns and peak demand. Um, right now, most of the vehicles on the road in the U.S., unfortunately, during commute hours, uh, over 90% have a single passenger riding in them. It's the driver. And there's also a lot of delivery trucks with, with just a single uh, passenger in them. Imagine if um, uh, your personally owned vehicle could park itself in a recharging station that was centralized, um, and anything that you ordered online would automatically get loaded into your trunk uh, of your car um, uh, while you were at work. And then when your car was dispatched to pick you up, um, you already had all your stuff uh, that you had ordered um, delivered uh, to your car. So that could actually remove all the, a lot of the delivery trucks uh, that are currently on the roads during uh, daytime hours as well. So I think this, uh, this could open up new ideas to have logistics hubs and parking uh, as a, a new way to think about the on-demand economy. And finally, at the bigger picture over the longer term, you know, we know that current cities have been designed around uh, manually driven cars can we think about how urban design could be changed uh, with automated cars and autonomous technology? So as I mentioned, converting parking lots and gas stations to green spaces, you could also potentially convert curbside uh, parking to bike lanes and, or wider pedestrian access. Um, and I think uh, this could make our cities not only more livable, uh, but uh, but even uh, potentially safer. Um, having a lot of parked cars on the sides can often lead to blind corners, uh, which is the source of many accidents. Um, we can also think about a truly radical urban center redesign. I'm a big fan of the um, 
the Fußgängerzone, the, the pedestrian zones that are in a lot of European center cities. Uh, the reason why they're so wonderful is because uh, there's a lot less noise, uh, better air quality, and they're, they're simply a lot safer to just walk around uh, cobblestone streets in the, in the downtown center. Sometimes it's done in Europe for a practical reason because, again, these cities you know, predated automobiles and, and it was when there were horses around. Um, but it certainly is much nicer to enjoy a city center uh, with, without the, the worry about uh, a lot of uh, vehicle traffic. Uh, imagine if you simply moved all vehicle traffic underground. And apparently in in some cities in Russia, they're moving a lot of shopping underground. Part of it is for weather reasons, uh, because half the year it's extremely cold, but uh, they've been able to um, essentially pre-pour large concrete walls and then excavate the spaces in between them to build giant underground shopping malls in Russia. So when we think also about uh, this technology, we can also think about how electric vehicles and zero emissions vehicles um, will have a huge positive impact on our cities. If we think about um, new mobility, uh, Toyota is experimenting with a lot of different new form factors. One of them is the iRoad. It's uh, an electric vehicle design uh, that has active balancing and stability. And um, what's really wonderful about it is that um, it its width is such that you can uh, fit um, two of them and essentially double the number of lanes uh, that, um, that you have with the existing street. So without changing or doing construction to add more lanes, you could imagine uh, doubling the throughput if you had urban centers with, with these types of vehicles. These can seat up to two people. Um, it's, it's, it's nicer than a motorcycle because uh, of the closed cabin, you could potentially have um, uh, climate control and um, it'll protect you from wind and rain and, and weather. Um, and also, it, uh, uh, it, in one parking space, you can fit uh, up to three of these. So you could imagine uh, not only um, saving parking uh, and relocating it from the urban centers, but you can have a much more densely packed uh, uh, parking because these vehicles are so much smaller. These are still experimental, uh, but um, it, it's interesting to think about um, what form factors will work well, especially if we do have a lot of uh, mobility as a service, transportation on demand, and a lot of people as single passenger riders. Also, we think about fuel cell vehicles, the, the Toyota Mirai. Um, Toyota's making um, uh, its fuel cell patents available. And, um, and we brought uh, to California, I had a chance to test drive, and it's, it's really wonderful um, with a long range and truly zero emissions, uh, wheel to well, uh, very environmentally friendly, um, and uh, refuels in, in just about five minutes. Um, and uh, what's wonderful is that um, these are perfectly well suited when you have central parking structures or refueling stations, as well as for large trucks and buses, uh, where we think about diesel-powered uh, buses and trucks. So finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about how all of this technology fits uh, with a parallel advancement in artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is also part of the reason why people have been really excited. Um, if you think about search-based planning, um, so back in 1997, um, Gary Kasparov, uh, who was the reigning world chess champion, was defeated by IBM's Deep Blue. And IBM's Deep Blue system searches about 200 million chess boards per second. And that's not how a human plays chess, but it is amazingly effective. And, um, and Moore's Law, which has been the doubling of CPU power every 18 months, has been remarkably consistent and has been allowing more and more brute force types of algorithms to become more and more effective and solve more and more problems. And about a year ago, um, the team from uh, DeepMind um, as part of Google uh, created AlphaGo, which defeated the world Go champion in Korea. And many 
AI researchers didn't believe that this was going to happen for many, many decades. So what was the big change? And of course, it's machine learning. And I think even more, it's the ability to do uh, massively parallel computations in uh, the cloud in modern data centers. So when we think about what will happen when we have these data centers connected to a lot of devices, not only our smartphones, but our robots, um, we had started a project when I was at Google called uh, the Cloud Robotics Team, uh, where we talked about um, this concept of turning your old smartphone into a connected robot. A lot of people were turning over their smartphones every 18 months and essentially giving to them to their kids to play games. Uh, these are effectively supercomputers and they have all the things necessary to make a, a robot. And uh, we open sourced um, a lot of that work and um, ported the robot operating system from Willow Garage to run on Android so you could turn your old phones into a robot. But the larger uh, picture is that not only is Moore's Law powering incredible advances, but wireless networking has enabled a remarkable uh, transformation of uh, computation and data on demand. If you think about the peak mobile broadband speed that we've seen in the last 10 years, there's been a 1600x growth. Um, nobody would have believed 10 or 15 years ago that people would be able to watch high definition video on their mobile devices and everyone could watch it all at the same time. So incredible uh, bandwidth has uh, enabled a lot of new applications. So when we think about cloud-enabled robots and cloud-connected cars, I think one of the key advantages is that it provides a shared knowledge base and unifies information about the world just in much the same way that um, humans use Wikipedia or other um, websites that organize information as reference materials. You could imagine uh, cloud-connected robots and cars um, going to central databases to find information about things in the world. It also means that you could offload a lot of these heavy compute tasks to the cloud. And instead of having a car or a robot that needs to carry around all the compute and power necessary to and, and storage necessary to, um, to solve a problem, uh, it'll be able to use this computation and storage on demand as a service. That means there can be fewer needs for hardware upgrades um, that can happen invisibly and hassle-free in the cloud, as well as fewer software pushes. So as soon as um, a software push is patched in the cloud service, all of the robots or connected cars have an invisible uh, hassle-free patch. And I think this idea of a, a reusable library of skills, when we think about uh, motor skills for an intelligent robot, or uh, driving behaviors for cars. We can think about data mining the history of all of these uh, cloud-connected machines uh, in order to make all of them more proficient. So just a couple of quick examples. Uh, already, this one has been transforming the way that we interact with our smartphones. We are now able to have um, real-time speech-to-speech. That means you can speak in one language and have your mobile device um, translate in, in real time to another language and then have uh, someone else speak back in that uh, other language and then have it translated back to you. Uh, it's the, the Star Trek communicator that we've all been dreaming about. Uh, there's no reason why every cloud-connected robot shouldn't be able to speak all, all languages. Another example is um, perception. So um, many of you may have uh, used years ago the, the experimental app Google Goggles, which allows you to point your smartphone at a famous painting or a, a statue, uh, and then it would uh, essentially do a visual lookup and be able to search and tell you who painted that and when it was painted. Um, there's no reason why we couldn't have a robot that is able to capture an image of something in the world and then retrieve semantic information about it, um, how to grasp it, how much does it weigh, what are the usage patterns, and any other domain knowledge necessary for it to successfully uh, manipulate that robot. And I uh, show you the human support robot, which is a platform that Toyota is developing uh, and also has been chosen as a standard platform for the RoboCup at Home in Nagoya this summer uh, to try and challenge people to build reliable manipulation uh, and solve, it, uh, solve some of these tasks. Um, but I think the larger picture is it enables robot 
sourcing. So much like human crowdsourcing helps scale hard semantic problems globally, uh, like Wikipedia or uh, map making, uh, the large scale deployment of data sharing robots, robots uh, in, in cars offers similar advantage. So I remember a colleague at Carnegie Mellon telling me that I know that this machine learning algorithm is going to work. It's just that my robot breaks down before I have enough data. And, uh, and I think instead of having one robot run for 10,000 hours, let's try and have 100 robots run for 100 hours and collect the same amount of data. So I think that's the potential uh, for the cloud robotics data sourcing. So when we think about connected cars and, and how this is transforming vehicle intelligence through deep learning, you think about these are some LADAR traces of cars and vehicles. Um, it's already had a huge impact on natural language understanding and speech and, of course, in object recognition with things like ImageNet. Um, but the future of connected cars means that you're able to gather novel data and upload these new exemplars and then update those trained models in the cloud and then broadcast back to the entire fleet uh, an updated model that's more reliable. And I think this is how we're going to scale some of the very, very hard problems in terms of perception and uh, very, very tricky corner cases that are, of course, really difficult to deal with at scale. Uh, but let's let the entire fleet learn and improve over time. And, uh, and I think this is a, an exciting way that we could potentially uh, crowdsource and robot source the gathering of this data and also the um, uh, improvement uh, of the behaviors over time. So I just wanted to end with one example of this, which I think uh, illustrates the point quite well. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are investing uh, significant resources in mapping. And one of the unfortunate uh, uh, realities of a, a large mapping effort is that as soon as you gather the data, it's out of date. So how do you deal with the staleness problem of mapping? And um, this was uh, demonstrated uh, as a proof of concept uh, back in uh, CES 2016. but. The idea is, is that many cars now have backup cameras or forward cameras that are able to uh, look at uh, images of the road surface. That means they can detect where the line markings are. And let's say you have a car that has um, a pre-image of the road surface and road signs and speed limits, and then is able to do a smart differencing. Uh, if lane markings get repainted, if a pothole appears, um, those differential pixels are then sent up to a centralized cloud server, which can then broadcast back to the fleet uh, and stitch together a uh, image of the roadway surface that can be kept up to date. Uh, there's 10 million cars that uh, Toyota sells globally each year. That means there's about uh, roughly 100 million Toyota vehicles running around the planet. Um, odds are that a Toyota vehicle will pass by a street near you every 30 seconds or a few minutes. Um, that way you could actually keep a map um, up to date uh, without stale, staleness. So this we think is really exciting and uh, is, uh, is something that we're, we're looking at and exploring. But going forward, I think we're going to see uh, an incredible diversi diversification of these new application areas, not only for transportation, but in manufacturing, in defense, uh, medical, uh, in space. And of course, uh, logistics, moving packages and, and objects around, uh, as well as other consumer products as uh, the technology matures. So uh, in closing, um, I think it's very exciting to think about how the next generation of these intelligent vehicles will enable us to think and rethink how our cities and urban centers are designed. Um, the promise of cloud computing and big data and the ubiquitous connectivity that comes with uh, wireless uh, technology is going to cause an incredible advancement in not only uh, the intelligence, but the, um, the safety and access and reliability uh, through services that will be uh, provided through these connected robots and cars. And then finally, when we think about the uh, the true promise of cloud robotics enabling these cheaper, lighter, smarter robots with the shared knowledge base, uh, having the robot sourcing of data and data mining and machine learning applied to make the entire fleet uh, more performant and more useful 
holds incredible promise. Uh, and I think one of the keys is to work closely with academia, government, and industry and form partnerships uh, to make things work, much the same way that I think the partnerships uh, that stimulated the advances uh, in autonomous driving uh, dating back to the DARPA Grand Challenge have uh, resulted in today's incredible explosion and uh, exciting progress. So that were, was the main um, uh, thoughts that I wanted to share and I'm happy to talk about uh, this and other questions that you may have. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks so much James, that's great. Really helpful. And we're going to move into Q&A now. So we have a bunch of questions that have already come in in the questions panel and the control panel, but there's been a, a several about um, slides available and recording of the webinar. Both of those will be available tomorrow on our um, on our website, cityminded.org. If you go to the home page, there's a, an image for today's webinar, and you can click on that, and you'll be able to download the slides, um, James's slides, as well as um, find a, a video recording of today's webinar. So a bunch of questions around, um, well, one, safety, which we expected. <laughs> but maybe just quickly to touch on that, James, um, first question from Jamario Jackson, how might these technologies improve safety in general? And, um, you know, what, let's start with that one. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, how much? How how might technologies improve? How might all the a new AV technology improve safety in general? So it is truly remarkable um, that you know cars have become incredibly safe uh, because of technology advancements. Whether it's uh, you know uh, anti-lock brakes and um, the forward collision warning and automatic emergency braking, um, which Toyota now has standard on almost all makes and models of vehicles sold in the U.S. Um, that can dramatically reduce uh, accidents and injuries. But going forward, when we think about um, making a car aware of its environment, um, I think the key technology problem is uh, perception. Um, you can have uh, the world's greatest planner or controller but if the perception system is giving it wrong information, it's going to do the wrong thing. So a lot of researchers in the field really feel that reliable and robust perception and environment understanding is key to, to making this technology safe. And um, you know, one of the, the big questions that uh, our CEO, Gil Pratt, highlighted in his CES address uh, this year in January was uh, asking the question, how safe is safe enough? Um, and this question uh, is, is more related to um, the society's uh, acceptance and embracing of the technology. Um, you know, the people developing the technology can work to show um, statistically that uh, it can reduce accidents and injuries dramatically. Uh, the fact is that we, uh, we have over 35,000 people killed in the U.S. every year due to car accidents the majority of them are due to human error and unfortunately the accident rate appears to be on the rise. Um, some people attribute it to distractions from mobile devices um, and it, uh, it's, it's true that uh, a computer will not become drowsy, drunk, or distracted and so uh, we should be able to um, make a system that will not have the same uh, failure modes that human drivers currently have. And one of the things we're looking at is um, and, and something else that Gil had talked about uh, in his CES address was the concept of guardian, where we have a uh, an autonomy system that is helping guard and protect the human driver. Um, and, uh, and that can be done in a number of ways, but you could imagine that uh, if a human driver is becoming uh, distracted or drowsy, that the autonomy system will be able to uh, provide warnings uh, to, to help uh, increase awareness and uh, ultimately be able to intervene and uh, uh, control the car, much like automatic emergency braking does, uh, to protect uh, a human driver uh, and also uh, 
uh, people around the vehicle uh, from injury or accident. So statistically, um, I think there's tremendous progress with this technology and, and promise uh, to reduce accidents and injuries. Um, the, the difficulty is uh, how safe is safe enough. Society actually tolerates a lot of human error. Um, and we expect our machines to be much better. Um, and, and, you know, we pose the question, what if the machine was twice as safe as a human-driven car? And, you know, statistically, 17,500 lives uh, were lost, uh, which is much better than 35,000. Uh, but would we accept such autonomy? So, uh, you know, that's another reason why I think uh, strong partnerships, uh, you know, between government, industry, and academia to think about these problems and help society come to, to the answer to the question, how safe is safe enough? Um, but we definitely believe that the technology has tremendous progress, and it's up to the society to sort of figure out uh, how to embrace it and how to move it forward uh, and utilize it. Thanks so much, James. Great. We're going to discuss a little bit more about cloud. Um, so is it true that uh, for driverless cars to work in cities, we need OEMs to agree on a certain num number of cloud-based platforms? And what do you think, what, what are the prospects for vehicle manufacturers, infrastructure providers to cooperate and agree on one or two of those? And can you talk a little bit about um, agreement on cloud-based and how how we get there? Sure, that's a, a great question. Um, the It's not necessary for OEMs to cooperate, but it certainly would be helpful. Uh, and when we think about uh, the infrastructure, the example I always like to use is traffic lights. Right now, there's uh, incredibly uh, talented research teams all around the world uh, building traffic light detectors uh, that have to work in uh, rain and weather and uh, different lighting conditions. And wouldn't it be really nice if the traffic lights all just broadcasted their state wirelessly uh, to every car uh, around them? Um, there's already been uh, standards proposed for V to I, uh, vehicle to infrastructure, and V to V, vehicle to vehicle. Um, Toyota's all already rolled out uh, V2V uh, based on the standard in, in uh, many of its cars. Um, but it does require, I think, um, uh, a commitment to upgrade the infrastructure. Um, and also, we should not, there isn't really a, a, necessary, a necessity to rely upon this infrastructure, but if it is there, uh, it can provide extra confidence. Uh, so, for example, um, it uh, as you know, whenever we engineer things, we like to engineer so that there aren't single points of failure. That there's you know sensing and, and information that's coming from multiple sources that can be cross-validated. Um, so there'll still be onboard sensors uh, to keep the car safe as it's passing through an intersection or intending to go through an intersection. But if the uh, traffic signals and other uh, uh, infrastructure is uh, broadcasting its state. Uh, it can then be a, a confirmation and validation of the sensor data. Uh, and if there is a conflict, then uh, the, the, the system can be made to be more careful. And, uh, and therefore, I think um, it's useful. And, um, and so the, the summary is that uh, although there is no standard uh, cloud services or, or V2V or V2I infrastructure that's necessary for uh, this technology to be rolled out, um, it certainly is helpful, and I think it can actually make it more robust if it is. So uh, we are st strong supporters of uh, cities investing in this to, to make the, the systems more robust, uh, but, uh, but it, it isn't actually required. Mm -hmm. And if, if we were to move to a smaller amount of cloud-based platforms, would that address some cybersecurity concerns or some cybersecurity questions from the audience? Yes, yes, uh, very, very good questions. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, decentralization is always uh, a, a way to try and avoid 
Um, having single points of failure, you know, which increase your surface area of potential threats. Um, but uh, I always like to use an example. Uh, when I was in graduate school about 20 years ago and the Internet was just getting started, uh, a very well-known professor was giving a seminar um, and uh, he stood up and he boldly proclaimed that uh, Internet banking will never happen because of the security concerns. Um, and nowadays, I think most of us, um, you know, we laugh about it because uh, if a bank doesn't offer internet banking, you know, most of us will just leave and find a new bank. Um, you know, but 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 back then, it really, really was a concern. And um, I think, uh, you know, the advances in security and privacy and encryption and all of that um, is uh, is is moving forward and uh, there's a lot of resources and research um, you know to make things more secure and better so I'm an optimist I think that we'll figure out ways um, to make the system secure and robust uh, but it is something that we have to you know plan ahead for and not as an afterthought and um, we, we also have to um, to realize that you know with all of these new technologies there's um, you know, convenience and risk, and I think in the case of internet banking, you know, the overwhelming convenience of having um, internet banking uh, outweighs the the, the risk uh, that people had had uh, were worried a lot about 20 years ago. Um, so uh, I think you know the answer is that um, you know yes, uh, decentralization I think is a good thing to uh, prevent single points of failure, but I also think that uh, better you know security and, and research in more secure systems will also help improve things. Great. So there's some questions I'm going to combine. Um, can you touch on the timeline of the driverless car entering the mass market, but also where does the U.S. rank on that trajectory compared to other countries? Uh, it's a great question. So one of the uh, confusions that is out there right now, there's a, there is a lot of excitement, uh, but also there's a lot of hype about um, uh, this technology. Uh, one of the points of confusion is when we look at the SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers, uh, levels for autonomy, uh, there's a distinction between level four and level five. Um, level four, the much touted, uh, and level five, the, 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 these are the true drop-in replacements for a human driver. So if we think of level five as being able to drive anywhere a human driver can drive under any conditions. We think that that is actually still quite a ways off. But you can start to add constraints. So you could say, well, how about when the weather's good or when traffic is light or if there's a dedicated lane? Um, then suddenly um, we can roll out some of those systems today. Uh, fairly reliably. So I think uh, that's where we get level four, where you start to add geofencing, you add uh, you know geographic constraints, uh, weather constraints, uh, traffic conditions, and then um, there's a continuum of difficult conditions all the way up to a true drop-in replacement for a human driver that drives anywhere um, a human drives, even if it doesn't have a map, for example. Um, so that's where a lot of the confusion comes from. So if we ask, uh, you know, under certain conditions, very precise conditions, yes, we can have level four autonomy today. Uh, do we have level five autonomy today? No. Um, when are we going to have it? Uh, I hope as soon as possible, but we still think it's, it's, it's quite a ways off. And um, what's nice is that as the technology develops and the vehicle gets smarter, we can start to relax the restrictions and start to expand the conditions under which uh, the systems are able to drive robustly. Um, with regard to different countries, you know, some countries have adopted a very aggressive approach and uh, really want to promote the technology. They, they see it as part of the future. Singapore is one example. Um, in the U.S., uh, we have a lot of states who are looking to to promote this as a, an incredible engine of growth and jobs and. And, uh, and they want to uh, look at how this technology uh, can be incubated. Washington State is a good example there. Um, you know, but unfortunately, we, we do worry about the patchwork of regulations that might result from states uh, trying to enact laws and regulations all on their own. That makes it a little bit harder for 
U.S. companies to think about uh, developing this technology and being compliant because the fact is that, you know, these vehicles will be driven across state boundaries. So that's why uh, the federal government um, is involved um, in, in looking at uh, ways to, to help promote the technology, uh, not stifle it, uh, but work together to, to make sure that it's uh, deployed uh, responsibly and safely. And of course, uh, you know, the the standard for auto manufacturers has been, has been always uh, self-certification. Uh, as the technology matures, then it becomes standardized and, and uh, regulations are put in place. So we see a similar trajectory for this technology. Um, and again, uh, we think that um, the, uh, you know, the, the various governments are, are going to have to uh, strike the right balance between not only helping provide a fertile environment for the technology to, to progress, um, but also to uh, uh, strike that balance between uh, the, uh, the the safety and uh, and, and risk to uh, developing this technology. As with any new technology, there will be uh, risks. Great. Um, some questions: Is there? Do you think cities are ready for autonomous vehicles, and are there policies cities can can um, shape and pass that support AV when maybe we don't have it yet at the federal or state level? Um, I think there uh, there are several cities that um, that that are ready and and actually really want uh, this technology. Um, of course, it, it it really depends on the infrastructure and um, and sort of the the unique situations or uh, problems that that current cities are facing. Um, when we look at the developed world, um, it's obviously much different uh, than um, the developing world in terms of uh, traffic and and patterns. Uh, you know, their personally owned vehicles are are a tiny fraction of uh, the population. Uh, well, most of the people in the world um, do not own vehicles, uh, but must get around uh, through a, a taxi service or a ride-sharing type of service. And you know, Mexico City, uh, you know, many parts of the world, there's these mini buses with the doors ripped off, and and somebody, uh, you know, yelling to people on the street, "Hey, where are you going?" Um, we obviously can do a lot better with uh, the technology uh, and now that everybody has, is starting to get smartphones even in the developing world. So I think there's incredible promise uh, and embracing of this technology as we, as we go forward. Um, and I think uh, mobility as a service is truly one of those uh, transformative um, uh, things that, you know, because of smartphone and connectivity and the autonomy technology, there's a, there's a perfect blend. Um, you can de de deploy uh, autonomy uh, as part of a mo mobility on-demand service uh, in, a, in a really nice way. For example, when the traffic is light, when the weather is good, when you have a, a, a good map, you can dispatch a driverless car to pick up somebody and deliver them to where they need to get going. Uh, if the traffic's bad, the weather's bad, your map is out of date, there's road construction, you send a human driver. So there's a perfect blend uh, between the uh, autonomy and the human-driven cars uh, for mobility as a service. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think there's uh, such an incredible uh, investment activity and excitement around this topic. Great. Thank you. There are a lot of questions about the impact of AV on suburbs and rural areas, um, as well as a lot of questions on how we can ensure this actually reduces congestion. Um, so I think the key to that is how do we move really to a truly shared economy of vehicles, as well as truly clean shared <laughs> system. So do you have any thoughts about how we move to um, a system where AVs are shared, electric, or um, Mirai-based hydrogen fuel cell? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, we, you know, Toyota has always been committed to um, investing in technology that improves safety, um, access to mobility, as well as the environment. Uh, and, of course, with the fuel cell, you know, Mirai, that's one uh, example. It's also, you know, Toyota's commitment to the, you know, developing the hybrid synergy drive with the Prius 
while a lot of other OEMs uh, were building, you know, gas guzzling SUVs, uh, you know, we, we felt that this was uh, something that would be a great transitional technology and, and to help improve, um, you know, uh, our carbon-based uh, uh, reliance. Um, but when we think about traffic and we think about safety and we think about the environment, um, they're all very complex, interconnected issues. Um, you know, people have speculated, well, if, if you always can uh, get transportation on demand, um, then maybe people would want to move out to the suburbs and then um, uh, there'll be more cars on the road. Um, and so, you know, building a system where you truly utilize the underutilized seats in the car um, you know, as it stands, a lot of personally owned vehicles, uh, you know, during peak rush hour have a single passenger in them, over 90% in the U.S. Um, and certainly uh, we can do better um, uh, and, and we can optimize uh, the, the fleet uh, picking up and um, uh, getting people where they need to go. And also, uh, you know, a shift away from personally owned vehicles uh, could mean a, a better utilization of the vehicle. Instead of being parked, 95% of the time it is used more. But you can't get around the fact that during peak demand, during rush hours, you, you might have the same number of people who need to get to the same places they need to go. But the question is, can you better utilize the existing seats that are currently moving? Uh, there's a lot of people who could carpool that don't. And uh, can you build cloud services or other mobility as a service um, uh, applications that will uh, better utilize and combine uh, uh, people going in the same direction uh, to then reduce uh, traffic. But as I said before, you know, there's still a lot of, of, of U.S. cities that have curbside parking that could be just completely uh, repainted and made into lanes. And so you would double throughput anyway if you, were, if you, if you removed the reliance on having to uh, park in our crowded urban centers where you know, the throughput uh, of the uh, main arteries needs to be uh, maximized in order for uh, better flow. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential. I think the data has to be analyzed more carefully, uh, and there's a lot of people looking at it. Um, I think MIT had a, uh, one of our partners had a recent paper that came out um, with Daniel Russ's group that was looking at 95% um, of the taxi trips in New York could be serviced by something like 20% of the fleet. Uh, I, I apologize, I forget the exact numbers, but it was something quite dramatically small. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, there is overall, uh, with ride sharing, um, an incredible potential to, to uh, improve traffic and reduce congestion. Um, but we need to look at the data and we sort of, sort of have to think through um, all the implications. Great. So that kind of that segues me perfectly into um, how we're going to continue this conversation. We we've we've touched on this at, at our annual summit in 2016. We held a workshop to discuss how we how we move towards a shared and clean um, AV future, and we did that with with Toyota and Natural Resources Defense Council and a bunch of other folks. So we're going to continue that conversation because it's going to take academia and startups, entrepreneurs public sector and the private sector to work together to move towards a and clean and shared autonomous future if, if that's if that's really a what everyone what we all want. So we're gonna continue that conversation at Meeting the Minds twenty seventeen, our annual summit in October, which we're convening in Cleveland, Ohio, and you can find more information at cityminded.org about that. Um, many thanks to Toyota for helping us continue the dialogue over the last eleven years. Um, and with that, we're going to have to wrap up because we're, we have so many questions we didn't get to, but we will, um, is there anything, James, for people to contact you? I know there were jobs you wanted to mention at TRI. Yeah, yes, we're, uh, we're hiring. If you're interested in working with us, uh, we'd love to hear from you, uh, but we're super excited about uh, this technology and its promise and, of course, working with um, uh, Meeting of the Minds to help uh, spread the word and to, um, to, to really uh, bring people together to think about uh, these problems and, and making the world a better place. So we're really excited about it. We'd love uh, for you to contact us uh, if you'd like to join us. And the best place is jobs at tri.global, Jim? That's a, that's a good place to start. <laughs> okay, great. 
Thank you so much, James. And we hope to see you at next month's webinar on our blog and our, at our annual summit in October. All more information is available at cityminded.org. So many thanks to James and John Hansen and the whole team at TRI, as well as uh, the Media of Minds team, Dave and Caroline and Gordon and others. So that concludes our session for today. And have a great day, everybody. Thanks again, James. This was great. Thank you. Bye, everybody.